What's up, everybody? Welcome to Kind of Funny Games Daily for March 21st, a Thursday, 2024. I'm one of your hosts, Greg Miller, alongside Forbes 30 Under 30, a.k.a. the second best baby blues in San Francisco, a.k.a. the New York Times quoted at Tim Gettys. Let Tim host. Hi, Tim. How are you? Good. Speaking of hosting. Alana hosted the GDC Awards. Wow, what a transition. Yes, she did. Alana Pierce hosted the GDC Awards last night. Yeah, did you watch? Uh, I did not watch. Okay, you saw the social stuff. I saw a lot of the social stuff going around. She killed it. She crushed it. I was there. Alana, great job as always. You know what I mean? What a talented individual. Also, just love seeing all the presenters. I love all the variations that we've seen here. That's not the way you say that, but you get what I'm saying there, Greg. You were there, though. Tell me all about it. It was great. Uh, yeah, I was at the GDC Awards last night, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, the the uh, IDGA Awards, right? The uh, Independent Game Awards. Uh, they do those, and then they do the GDC, but they do them back to back, which is super In nice. Same room? Same room, same everything. Cool. Yeah, yeah, just the same stage, everything else. Yeah, they just do two so they can take care of everybody. Uh, but yeah, uh, a great time, a fantastic time. Uh, shout out to the Venba team. Of course, uh, one of my favorite games of last year on my list, you know that. Uh, of course, uh, maybe you don't know. Uh, Abby and Sam, the two guys who were like had the idea for Venba and went for it, kind of funny best friends. Uh, they, you know, they are, cool. They've been with Greg Miller on the podcast journey a long time. So... On top of that, uh, Jen and Papa Jenda, you know, helped get their codes distributed and all that jazz. But uh, they had hit us up and were like, hey, we, you know, are nominated a bunch of times. Would you want to come sit at the table? And I was like, fuck yeah, I want to come sit at the table. Whoa. You want to kidding me? And they kept winning. <laughs> I don't know amazing. if you saw that. Uh, during the uh, Independent Games Festival Awards, uh, Venbo won the Seamus McNally Grand Prize. Very like the cool. biggest, like their game of the year award, they got or whatever. The grand prize. Bobby got up there, cool g- gave a great speech, just fucking crushed. You know, tackled the social issues that are going on in our life. Talked about landscape, uh, I don't know, layoffs. Talked about uh, Palestine. Talked about everything you'd want to if from somebody to go up there and actually own the moment. Fucking owned it. And then when the GDC awards started by Alana, uh, they also won two awards there. Uh, they got best debut and social impact awards. So sick. So man. fucking Congrats. awesome for them. A game we love so much here. Kind of funny that Jan and I would never shut up about. You see, yeah. When uh, Abby was on PS, I love you XOXO. When we gave the the very uh, very special come to a demo with us, where we got the demo for Venba with all of you, which was super fast. Love it. Missing Link says, "Are we in a rush? Why is everyone talking so fast?" Missing Link, I didn't know this was your first time. It kind of funny. Welcome. We talk like this all the time. You know what I mean? I, I, we're just out right. there having some fun. Uh, but overall, the GC Awards were great as always. You know, so fun to see stuff get nominated and win. And of course, when you got to the G, you know. The Independent Game Festival Awards, right? Those are the ones you haven't heard of. There's student games. There's people getting... There was one great story. I left my note, my note notes at home, so I don't want to misquote which one. But there was a game that won. And I think it might have been the Rhythm one. Uh, that got up there and was like, this is huge because we were nominated back in the day for the student game 10 years ago. Uh, we lost to Risk of Rain. <laughs> and we were working on this game. Yeah. Like we, but that that being nominated for that award was enough to make us come all the way up awesome. here. Awesome. So cool. Stay. Let me, I want to I give them a shout out. Uh, rhythm, 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 Rhythm. Which one was it? It was... Rhythm Doctor, excellent in games audio is who won there. And so they got up there and be like, hey, this is the journey for it. You know what I mean? And then one of the other people who won last night and was talking about, or it was the Lifetime Achievement Award, I think, one of them, where they were talking about like the first time they ever came to the GDC Awards. They were sat and they pointed back there and we were behind this giant pillar. (laughs) So shout out to everybody behind this pillar right now. You could be up here one day. And again, you know, in the same way, Dice, I love because it is developers honoring developers. Again, Dice is the tippity top of the industry. That is Tim Schafer, Moneybags, and Shuhei, and Phil Spencer, and all these people in the audience, the heads of studios, the heads of companies, right? And GDC also has that. Of course, Baldur's Gate 3 uh, won Game of the Year, the Audience Award, Best Design, uh, Best Narrative. I think I got all the GDC awards, right? And Sven was there, and everybody, you know, the people from Larry and you were expected were there. But he figured, independent. huh? They are independent. They are independent. Dave the Diver got nominated for a bunch of stuff. Not best indie, but I digress. Uh, you have all these developers there, and it is the people who are like the top of the studio, and then there are just, it's just a C in the back because your GDC badge gets you in. So it's a C in the back of just the people who are the, you know just some environmental person working on this. You know, I was getting a drink, and some guy's like, "Greg, man, I'm like, what's up, man?" And he worked on Madden. He's like, oh, "I'm an engineer." You know awesome, what I mean? It's, it's not so like cool. yeah, exactly. It's like cool to see our industry come together, celebrate that. You know, again tip of the tongue for so many speeches and so many jokes was of course the layoffs and addressing that and how we have to be how you know you have to be better like talking to the people who can make those decisions which was pretty huge totally Uh, but a great night and again 
to bring it back in bookend. Alana killed it as a host. She was just great there for the GDC Awards. So great for her. Love that. Love it so much. You know what else you love? Mm. Swimming in sevens. And boy, howdy, are you going to be doing that today? We've got the Princess Peach Showtime Review Roundup. We've got the Rise of the Ronin Review Roundup. We've got Shake Up Sid Bungie and so much more. We'll cover it all because this is Kind of Funny Games Daily. Each and every week, Dan, a variety of platforms live. We run you through the nerdy video game news need know about. Catch us on YouTube. Of course, catch us on Twitch and catch us on your favorite podcast service. If you love what we do, go catch that kind of funny membership. Either on YouTube or Patreon, you can kick us $10 and get each and every episode of Kind of Funny Games Daily ad-free. Get all of our other shows ad-free. Get the ability to watch our other shows live as we record them. And of course... Get the multimedia experience daily that is Greg Way, just for your viewing or listening pleasure. No bucks, sauce away, like, subscribe, share. You know all of that. Some housekeeping for you. It's PAX. Oh, yeah. It was GDC. It is now PAX East. They are bookending each other. They are on top of each other. They are dovetailing. Uh, what's going on really right now? question. Is it always like this every year with GDC right into packs? Lately, it has couple. been. Yeah, yeah, it wasn't always this way. It, it wasn't always, always this, this way. way. But yeah, Stupid. sometimes it's Stupid like never decisions. be this way again. Yeah. yeah, I believe I had some inside information from somebody when I was talking to them at Dice, and I think this might be the last year it's like Good. this, but I could be wrong. And that's at least till somebody changes their schedule again. Now, anyways, packs is starting right now. Snowbike Mike. Blessing Addy Oye Jr. and Ben Starr are on the same plane from San Francisco to that Boston. True? That is 100% true. They posted the photo of all of them waiting at the gate today. Awesome. I like that. <laughs> uh, and it's going to be kicking off tomorrow for us. Uh, tomorrow, Game Showdown Live is coming to you from PAX East with Blessing and a crew of guests. If you want to watch Kind of Funny's trivia show live, be in the PAX audience. It's going down Friday at 1 p.m. in the Albatross Theater. If you needed more of a reason to come. Snowbike Mike will be there as the official scorekeeper. Yeah. Meaning that Blessing's going to be very mad at Snowbike Mike by the end of the Jared day. Jared Petty's going to be there. Yeah. People haven't seen him in a long time. That's yeah. going to be fun. It's going to yeah. be exciting. Uh-huh. Jeff Grubb. Uh huh. Iffy. Iffy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's going to be an awesome show. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Saturday, Snowbike Mike is hosting the Grounded Pax East panel alongside Obsidian. This is going down at 2 30 p.m. This is Eastern Time, of course, in the Albatross Theater. Uh, but you can also watch online at twitch.tv slash pax2. Right after that, all the kind of funny best friends will grab Snowbike Mike and you will move as a unit to go watch Blessing host uh, Code Sweat and Cheers, How We Made Cyberpunk 2077 Phantom Liberty. Uh, it's also a PAX East, obviously, and it's CD Projekt Red's panel. You can join Bless and CD Projekt Red over at the PAX East Main Theater on March 23rd, of course, Saturday, 3.30 p.m. Eastern Time. And if you can't attend in person, you can watch the live stream on the official PAX East Twitch channel. A lot going on there. Mm-hmm. It's going to be fun. Of course, right now, there's new episodes of PS I Love You, XOXO, and WrestleMania ranked up on their YouTube channels and podcast services. Thank you to our Patreon producers, Carl Jacobs, Kieran Hovasapian, Delaney Twining. What? The screencast feed. Recently, been a lot of WrestleMania, right? Yeah. We haven't been pu- posting anything else today. That changes. X-Men 97, everybody. X-Men 97, episodes one and two. Me, Andy, Nick, Greg, giving our thoughts. Going to be a great time right after this. Show. You could use your kind of funny membership to watch us record that live right after this, right? Mm-hmm. It's not live for everybody, right? It, it is. Ah, oh, okay. fuck. All right. Well, yeah, kind of funny members. You'll get the other thing. Don't worry about it. Uh, today, we're brought to you by Shady Rays and Robin. Uh, tomorrow, Ghostbusters in review. Is that live for everybody? I know we're posting no, it right no, away. No, no, That will be live only Get for your kind of funny membership and watch Ghostbusters in review. All right, four out of ten? Yo, fuck you. I'll find it. I'll tell you. I digress, ladies and gentlemen. That, let's save all the Ghostbusters business. Yeah. Oh, you're coming. You're going oh, with I'm me coming. today? It's you, me, and Nick in the same uh-huh. theater, right? Exciting. Yeah. Are the people coming? I don't think for this 2 p.m. show, no. no. I think, no. Post stuff? No po? Oh, that's next. Poe's not uh, in town until next okay. week. Okay, cool. Big news, everybody. Poe and Jack are in town next week. Woo! That's Jack might so be long. a little too young for Godzilla. That was what yeah. we were concerned mm. about. Godzilla. Yeah. yeah. Godzilla. Anyways, I digress. Uh, today we're brought to you by Shady Rays and Robin Hood, but we'll tell you about that later for now. Let's begin the show with what is and forever will be the Roper Report. Time for some news. We got five items on the Roper Report. A baker's dozen. Let's start by hitting the question mark block and going to talk about Princess Peach Showtime. Uh, reviews have popped. Metacritic is at a 75. Uh, I want to, before, I, you know, I know we've seen trailers for this. Yes. 
But I, I was like, maybe people don't know. So I was like, what is this game? And I stole from the Game Informer review that I'll come to later that describes it like this. Showtime's overall premise is one of the highlights as it creates an aesthetically interesting world that is able to look and play differently from level to level, but still maintain a consistent and welcoming style. While, the, while visiting a theater to take in a show, the facility is attacked by the Sour Bunch for reasons that are ultimately unimportant. <laughs> what is important is Peach is put in charge of re re returning everything to normal because she happens to be present and capable. Dash dash. A classic Die Hard scenario. The design of every level leans into the theater premise really with a spotlight is. following Peach as she progresses. Set changes marking new areas and strings from the rafters being used to make elements look like they're floating through the air. Seeing what every new stage looks like is fun, even for the repeated themes. But Peach's costume changes are the primary focus. Peach has a multitude of multiple cost costumes that dictate her distinct abilities in different levels. And while they are not all winners, they are all at least solid. Again, that's Game Informer, who I will read last, Kyle over there. But for now, we're going to start with Well Played, who gave it an 8.5 out of 10. Ash Whaling said, Nintendo has a knack for finding brilliant new ways to keep an existing formula fresh. And in the case of Princess Peach Showtime, they have managed to take the concept of a simple platformer and spin it on its access to create something varied and engaging. The Showtime format offers a fantastic opportunity to explore the capabilities of Peach as a character, allowing her to literally slip into multiple roles and wear a myriad of hats, crushing each and every one she attempts. I came away hopeful to see more in the future, though I will admit I'd love to see a dedicated Mighty Peach game, if they want to explore that Captain Toad treasure tracker spinoff ride at some point. Please, Nintendo. VGC gave it four out of five stars. Andy Robinson wrote, it's, it's a simply wholesome experience, stuffed full of variety and simple but fun mechanics. Showtime likely won't be as fondly remembered as Nintendo's biggest hitters, but it does finally give Princess Peach a charismatic starring role she deserves. At the very least, that's worth celebrating. Full of personality and variety, Princess Peach Showtime delivers a performance that's better than the sum of its parts, with some shallow mechanics lost in the glitz of its cabaret show. The challenge is definitely geared towards youngsters, but even experienced players will find it difficult to not be charmed. And finally, rounding it all out, Game Informer gave it a 7.5. Kyle Hilliard wrote, Princess Peach Showtime could be a decent first game for young Peach fans, but longtime Nintendo players looking for, princess, for the princess's equivalent to a quality Kirby platformer will likely be underwhelmed. Stylistically, however, the game is a success and, in typical Nintendo fashion, features an exciting finale. I just wish the difficulty had been more balanced in one direction or the other. Hmm, interesting. Timothy, I've never met a bigger Nintendo fan than yourself. I, I appreciate that. Yeah, I played the demo of this when yeah. they dropped it a couple weeks ago, and I talked about it on Games Daily. We did not get review codes for this game. Uh, our Nintendo rep was telling us that uh, they gave them to some outlets. It was fairly limited. They were mainly looking for uh, different audiences, like a more general, like, um, mainstream media, like yeah, the outside sure. of video games type thing to try to get I think as you read through these previews, right, you're hearing like, oh, decreased difficulty, yep. yada, yada, yada. You're so, not going for hardcore gamers like you kind of funny best friends. So totally understand that. And um, I I was not hot on the, the demo. I was pretty disappointed, honestly, like for me, because I was hoping that this was going to hit that mark of a Luigi's Mansion or mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. like they someone mentioned earlier, Captain Toad, where it is a simple idea and it is a spinoff, but they're really going all in on it. And it's fun for kids and there's something there for the adults. Sure. And I wasn't finding too much for the adults uh, um, on top of uh, a myriad of technical issues that I was pretty surprised. Frame rate by, gets honestly. brought up a few times it's, in some of the reviews it was, out there. It, I would go as far as saying bad wow. uh, in, in the demo even. And the loading screens are abundant and just it, it really takes you out of the experience. Um, having said that, a lot of to love here, and I do think that this game is going to hit with kids. Yeah. Um, I am excited to play through it. I do want to beat this game, and um, I think that the plan is for me to start uh, with Andy next week on stream. Oh. So I think we're just gonna like, and I, I think I might hold off playing it this weekend so we can just start from the get ready and get get, fresh get it all together because I doubt it's going to be too long. Are but... you guys going to order matching costumes so that when you switch costumes in the game, you can switch costumes in real life? You know, I was searching for the game to see the actual release date, which is tomorrow Friday, and there was a a lot of cosplay that you could buy already of the nice. different outfits and i'm nice. like good for you internet yeah. that's that's pretty wild uh tim a question for the performance stuff. oh i'm sorry real quick we have a question from kind of funny.com's bear courtney uh yes uh, uh from the press pool over here um do you think that this is a game that will benefit from a nintendo switch 2 with the performance no i don't 
I, like that's the thing is I just feel like it was man I'm speaking out of my depths here a little bit but it's just like it does seem like it just wasn't made correctly to, mm. to with the, the it's not like it's pushing boundaries or anything it's just like the the loading screens it, it feels like one of the things where they knew they can get away with what they were doing and hey maybe the budget this, with this game that's all that they could do and I think that that's in some ways totally acceptable for the target audience that isn't going to notice these problems at all yeah i just also think putting the full price on the game then is a little bit like well you got to bring that in consideration when we're critically talking about this game so it's kind of a a tale of two things here where it's like on one hand i'm like it seems like they're going to nail this like it seems like this is going to make the group of people they're trying to make happy very happy i look at it and it is one of those like I, i don't know I haven't played the demo. You talk about the difficulty, though. I do go, oh, man, this seems like something Ben would be fun for, for his, like, not his first game, but something to jump in there. Here's what's really interesting about this. Like, uh, playing Disney's Illusion Island last year, I remember. I, I fell in love with it, and one of my biggest things about loving it is it is such a good first Metroidvania for kids, and they're going to be able to learn this new genre, learn what makes video games so special. It, it, the game does such a great job of easing you into a very important genre in video games. Sure. And on top of that, it's an amazing video game and it runs incredibly well. And there's all those other things and there's fun for adults and all that stuff. So yeah, I was yeah. like, oh, that's awesome. This so far, I, it, from the demo alone, didn't see a lot of the great for adult stuff it running well and all that. But I do think it does have that same quality of this is going to be a great entry point into more action-based games for people. Because I think mm-hmm. a lot of the Mario games, more, more straight platformer type stuff, I feel like this is a great blend of enhanced mini games from a mario party really getting you to think and understand about how the camera can work and how the, d- the space of video games the d- the 3d space of like going there's a, a boss fight that we saw a clip of a second ago that i got to play in the demo even where it shifts from going left to right and you start going like more like crash bandicoot style against Running, the boss yeah, yeah, yeah. and it's these like little simple things with very simple controls that i do think is going to go a long way in teaching young children the different styles of games out there and that they're not all just this or just that and i think it's really important that genres are being thought on a how do we strip this down to be understood by somebody that has never played something like this before sure. so that one day they can play a bayonetta you know what i mean <laughs> yeah, or, yeah, no, or totally. a Devil May cry well it's or, like a different thing like where that. you know we think so much now and i know that i'm very old but like you, you think about like the shared background so many people have and what is your first metroidvania and what is your first platformer and da, da, da. if you're making a game that could be the kind of swiss army knife of giving you a whole bunch of different tastes and they you're not gonna go back to crash bandicoot and run at the camera right on ps1 but you do it here and you understand that yeah it's it's cool and i so yeah i'm excited to play through it i hope that there's some fun surprises everything you just write in the review blurbs feels kind of in line with what i expect this to be um but it also gets me a little more excited like they're them talking about it having a great nintendo end i'm like cool like there's a charm nintendo has that even when things aren't great like there's often things to love about it and I am a little bit let down because I do think that uh, it it kind of feels like this could have been more, um, but the maybe classic. maybe it just shouldn't have been more. I'm not so sure, but <laughs> that's it's a complicated thing to talk about because I'm sure like every time I say people are like, Tim, it's not for you. It's like, but it could have been fairly easily, you know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, you I dropped in a link. Yeah, out. you dropped in a link here. What do you what do you want to link? So there's been to? something really weird going on with Nintendo. All right? <laughs> You're telling so, me for how many years? So I want to I want to read through this article um, by Andy Robinson over at Video Did Games Chronicle. Yeah, yeah. And I want to read the whole thing because I, I feel like it, it's it's telling a pretty interesting story in, in multiple parts here. Princess Peach Showtime is Goemon's designer's first directorial role in over 25 years. Good feel has finally been confirmed as the developer of the Switch game. Uh, Nintendo's Princess Peach Showtime's, I just said this, uh, Abisu is the founder and CEO of Tokyo-based Good Feel, who is the developer behind Showtime. Videos showing the game's credits on YouTube have confirmed, which we won't link directly to for spoiler purposes. Before founding Good Feel in 2005, Abisu was a programmer and game designer at Konami, working on games and franchises such as Castlevania. However, he's best known for directing the majority of games in the classic Goemon series, including Goemon 2, 3, 4 for Super Nintendo, and 1997's Mystical Ninja, starring Goemon on N64, which was the last title he directed before taking on a longtime producer role. I never played any of these games, but everybody is familiar with at least the box art of this, sure. right? 100%. You know what yep, I mean? Yep, like yep. that is a, that was like an N64 you knew quote, that one. quote classic, right? Like yeah. maybe you rented it, but like it you knew that game. 
Uh, Good film released in Japan only Switch game last year, which many fans have dubbed a spiritual successor, uh, but it was not directed by Abisu here. Uh, as with many of its recent collaborations, Nintendo's acted unusually secretive around the developer behind Princess Peach Showtime, even declining to confirm if Good Feel was working on it when asked. Previously, Nintendo declined to confirm who the new voice actor behind Mario was until people with early copies of Mario Wonder discovered it in the credits. After that, it was similarly secretive around the developer of Switch's Super Mario RPG. What you up to, Nintendo? Until its identity was discovered on a store page. Goodfield previously worked on the Nintendo games Yoshi's Woolly World, Kirby's Epic Yarn, Wario Land Shake It, and more. Uh, and then, yeah, Princess Peach will come out tomorrow, March 27th. Huh. There's a lot of just weird things going on. And I remember a couple months back, uh, after... Mario RPG was announced, but before it actually came out, um, I think I was playing either a preview or the review build of it, and I went to NVC at IGN. Sure, I remember and, that. Uh, and me and Seth and Reb were talking about the game, and Reb brought up, like, isn't it weird we don't know the developer? 100%. <laughs> and we, we were like, wait, really? We don't? And it was a conversation of, like, that is truly bizarre that they wouldn't let us know. And we were, like, scru scrubbing through the YouTube videos, and it was like, yeah, there's no info on this. We all started making assumptions, and it seems like the assumptions we've been making have been right. Like uh, me and I think it was Bless, even Evan Games Daily, have been talking about Pete Showtime, and we assumed it would be good feel because that just kind of makes sense based on Yoshi's Worldly World and Kirby's Epic Yarn. This game kind of seems in line with those, right? Sure. Um, but I, I don't know. This is and the Mario thing was always weird too, and it, it kind of made that Mario moment feel like there was like extra controversy than there needed to be with. Charles Martinet moving on, but then being a Mario ambassador, whatever that means, and then not talking about who the new voice actor is officially. It's like at the time I argued like, well, they don't want to make too much of a big deal because it's Mario. It's not yep. this person, whatever. But now you keep adding all this stuff up and it's like, why? What's going on? My take, and this is a very uncultured, I'm not, I'm not part of the Nintendo fabric, as you know. I've always found it that Nintendo is a brand that wants the brand to be Nintendo. You know, we joke around a lot about about your grandmother, your mom, or whoever, uh, uh, your granddad, saying, oh, Nintendo for every video game console, right? And I think, you know, one of the big uh, uh, pivot points for most people from what I would say is a, okay, yeah, you like games, so like, oh, you're into video games, is understanding developers, yeah. right? Understanding that, oh, PlayStation didn't make this, Naughty Dog did, and yeah, they're owned by PlayStation, but, you know, I feel like Nintendo always wants Nintendo up front. It's all about Nintendo. That's very true, but like of them wanting that, but I feel like they've made a move lately to actually make it that way. And, and to the point, Greg, that like, you know, even though they, they want to be Nintendo and I get that argument and at the end of the day, that is what it is. That still hasn't stopped them from having splash screens of every single thing. So I was like getting the, there. The I was care. getting there. That it's like, I think in a preview run up quiet, like it's just Nintendo, Nintendo. You play the game, you know what it is. But like so far in this recent thing, it's been even more hidden who's doing to, the game. To the point that it's like, you know, you play Smash Brothers, you see HAL Laboratory or Sora Limited or whatever. And I was always like, like, damn, this guy HAL's good. <laughs> he's so damn good. But like that, there we know. And it's like, I feel like that stuff, and not every game does that, but I feel like that's when the games that don't do it, that's when it's like, this is the real Nintendo. Like this yeah. is just Nintendo. You you know that, you get it, whatever. It's one of the EADs. Um, but then with this, it's like, it's not even in the, like, little font at the bottom of the title screen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. it's just, there's no, there's nothing until you get to I, the, the credits. I would wonder if they're pivoting that way. That's their new way of the, what they're going to do with their internal studios. Yeah. Of, like, why are we putting that up front? Because does anybody care outside of us? Yeah. And in the end, we get our answer of who's making the Yeah, I, I, maybe I'm being dramatic here. I just think that this is... There's a deep problem there. We've had so many issues with game crediting and like even thinking sure. about Metroid Prime and sure. uh, how it's a remaster, but it's like, you know, there was the whole issue where they didn't credit the original creators of the game correctly and yeah, yeah, they yeah. eventually changed that, I think, whatever. But it's like when you start thinking about that stuff, it's such a slippery slope where these credits matter a lot. And I feel like at every stage, like, sure, maybe there's like a reveal moment that they want to have of who's working on it, but like for the game to come out, and you need to beat the game to know who worked on it, which I know sounds like, yeah, that's how, that's credits, how credits work. work. But it's like, I don't know, something about it. And it, when we see everyone else, when the Naughty Dogs are becoming more prominent, when even everything, Indie Studios up, everyone is getting more credit for what they're doing because like it's the right thing to do. I don't like this. Especially in the landscape of where the rest of the industry is in right now that is taking advantage of workers, of like Nintendo kind of... It, it, it's tough to say double down right 
uh, right now just because there's been like these small examples of it, but kind of putting workers to the like backside of being like, ah, ignore the, the man behind the curtain who like worked on all of this. It's like, ah, we're Nintendo, you know, it's, it's weird. It's very weird. It is weird. Uh, Bander SN in the YouTube chat calls out that good feel isn't internal, but I would counter with it's a Nintendo property. We're talking the same way PlayStation Studios, if they're publishing the game, you know, uh, Helldivers and Arrowhead, they're not an internal studio, right? But he has the PlayStation Studios logo implying to you that it's a PlayStation exclusive, right? Yeah. And I would imagine Nintendo's deal now is that if you're working on a Nintendo quote unquote first party game, we used to call them second party games, but now they call them first parties. Like you're, it doesn't matter if you're, we don't own you. The contract's going to say that yeah. we're putting Nintendo front and center and not promoting you. Totally. That's just not cool. But, I agree. I, yeah. I'm with you. Totally, totally. I agree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 It's just that's – it is an unfortunate trend that I, I think you're right. I think we're going to see it more. I mean, we already are. But, yeah, I just – I don't like it. Well, I, you should call it Mr. Nintendo. You know what I mean? I will. Doug Bowser's over there being like, hey, I'm not going to help anybody else. Also, of course, remember, you need to keep us honest by going to kindoffunny.com slash you're wrong. Uh, Star says Nintendo's teams are now called EPD, not EAD. Cool. They were restructured in 2015. That is cool. There you go. Just a little bit of honesty. From us here at Kind of Funny. Just a little, though. Just a little bit. <laughs> There's a lot of other stuff we're going to say. It's not true at all. Don't worry about it. Uh, but what is true is that we couldn't make this 11-person independent operation in San Francisco run without you, ladies and gentlemen. If you've enjoyed Kind of Funny Games Daily so far, if you enjoyed our six-plus-hour stream of indie games on Monday, if you enjoyed all the guests we've had come through in GDC because we're kind of the last studio standing, well, we could use your help. Why not pitch us 10 bucks with the Kind of Funny membership, either on YouTube or Patreon? Of course, you get each and every episode of Kind of Funny Games Daily ad-free. You'd get all of our shows ad-free. You'd get the ability to watch us record the podcast in the afternoon live as we record them. And, of course, you'd get the multimedia experience daily. That is Greg Way. However... Right now, you're not using your benefits of the Kind of Funny membership. So here's a word from our sponsor. This episode is brought to you by Shady Rays, an independent sunglasses brand that has over 300,000 five-star reviews. They're on a mission to match affordability with durability, making top quality shades accessible to everyone. They have tons of styles and colors to pick from, so finding the best polarized shades is a breeze. Get ready for a whole new level of clarity with Shady Rays Pro Polarized Lenses. This lens tech is all about tough durability and vibrant colors that pop. Here at Kinda Funny, we all love wearing our Shady Rays. Whether it's Tim looking dope during his Pokemon Go walks, Snowbike Mike rocking the snow goggles, or Joey just looking fantastic in her tangle-free shades. If your shades go MIA or take a hit, don't sweat it. They've got lost and broken protection, so you're covered from day one. And if you don't love your shades, exchange or return them for free within 30 days. There's no risk when you shop. Exclusively for y'all, Shady Rays is giving out their best deal of the season. Head to ShadyRays.com and use code KF20 for $20 off each pair of polarized sunglasses. Try for yourself the shades rated five stars by over 300,000 people. Again, that is ShadyRays.com and use code KF20 for $20 off each pair of polarized sunglasses. This episode is brought to you by Robinhood. Did you know that even if you have a 401k for retirement, you can still have an IRA? Robinhood has the only IRA that gives you a 3% boost on every dollar you contribute when you subscribe to Robinhood Gold. But get this, now through April 30th, Robinhood is even boosting every single dollar you transfer in from other retirement accounts with a 3% match. That's right, no cap on the 3% match. Robinhood Gold gets you the most for your retirement thanks to their IRA with a 3% match. This offer is good through April 30th. Get started at Robinhood.com slash boost. Subscription fees apply. And now for some legal info. Claim as of Q1 2024 validated by Radius Global Market Research. Investing involves risk, including loss. Limitations apply to IRAs and 401ks. 3% match requires Robinhood Gold for one year from the date of first 3% match. Must keep Robinhood IRA for five years. The 3% matching on transfers is subject to specific terms and conditions. Robinhood IRA available to U.S. customers in good standing. Robinhood Financial LLC member SIPC is a registered broker dealer. And we're back, ladies and gentlemen. Number two on the Roper Report, Rise of the Ronin reviews are up as well. And we have your roundup, of course. I'm sure you all went and listened to PS I Love You XOXO, where me, Andy, and Snowbike Mike do our review so far on it. But let's talk to some other people. Metacritic right now has it at a 76. Twinfinite gave it a 4.5 out of 5. Uh, Cameron Waldrop said... 
Rise of the Ronin is not only a terrific Souls-like, but it presents a possible turning point in being the first high-profile entry in the genre to give difficulty choices. Even without that, it is still a fun game that anyone can get into and enjoy, as the combat is worth mastering because nothing beats the feeling of perf a perfectly timed counterspark. Plus, this is an excellent way to learn about an important time in Japanese history, if you don't already know it. Euro Gamer, Euro Gamer gave it a 4 out of 10. Uh, Alex, uh, That's not right. 4 out of 5, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much for keeping me honest there. Got Ghostbusters, Ghostbusters. in the mind. <laughs> If you'll notice, ladies and gentlemen, not one IGN review in here today. Mm. Because yesterday they showed their whole ass, and we know we can't trust IGN I hate reviews you anymore. So much, Greg. What? Don't you even can't start, start that. This, Last night at the no. Game Awards, I wouldn't hug Rebecca Valentine. <laughs> I was like, no, you hurt me today. You hurt me today. Oh, yeah, man. Reb, definitely. Who Don't is, listen, I'll start at the top and I'll go down till I get every one of these people. God. <sighs> Eurogamer gave it a 4 out of 5. Uh, Alan Wen wrote, If there is a downside to a more grounded, less fantastical depiction, uh, it's that the strictly human bosses lack the feeling of an event. Uh, more often than not, a mission ends with you fighting a large lad wielding a large weapon, and that's about the size of it. Uh, there will also be characters you'll face multiple times who never really evolve with each confrontation. Even when factoring in the absence of the supernatural, there's no one as memorable as larger than or larger than life as say Wo Long's uh, Lubu. As a Sony published release, Ronin doesn't quite. Oh, I'm sorry, Ronin isn't quite Team Ninja's Elden Ring. Even if it does evolve its Neo-like formula, with the help of existing open-world formula. What the hell? Formulae, sorry, sir. Uh, still, uh, while it's great to witness the renaissance of Japan Japanese games these past few years, there's something special about seeing a Japanese developer stepping up to reclaim the AAA open world samurai game for itself, especially one that cares more about being a video game than a Kurosawa film. Damn. Yeah. I mean, that's shade as fuck, right? I, it's something I drove home in my review uh, so far on that is I was like, this is a video game. Like this is a, this is, hey, f turn this on and go have fun. R use your grappling hook to jump up into the sky, open up your wingsuit, fly over, yeah. assassinate the dude, choke it. You know, it's like, and then uh, the story, I don't give a fuck. Like, I don't know, I'm doing this thing. Yeah, yeah I, I think I appreciate that they picked that lane and went with that lane and yeah, really yeah, ran yeah. with it. I don't think, I mean, there's shade to it, right? But I'm saying this review, this this is this review. Even the line, line, I think it's a. I think again, it's a great way to synops synopsize what they've done here. Hmm. Gamespot gave it a seven. <laughs> Phil Hornshaw said. So while Rise of the Ronin has some elements that can frustrate or require some investment to make sense of, and weaker elements like some open world design that comes off as dated or some repetition in level design, it does a great job of getting you invested in what's going on and the people involved. Bond missions in particular are a standout, but a mix of pers personal stakes and large-scale politics make the historical story compelling all the way through. The longer you play Rise of the Ronin, the more characters you meet and spend time with, the more you will learn about its combat and its world, the better it becomes. It's not without some flaws, but I finished Rise of the Ronin with much more left to do, and even after 50 hours, I want to head back to see what I missed in an attempt to change history. The parts of the game that work uh, more than... The parts that work more than balance out the weaker elements. And while it took a while to find the rhythm of Rise of the Ronin's combat, its speed, complexity, and intensity make some phenomenal fights that always feel great to win. Rise of the Ronin is a game that might take a bit, uh, that might take a bit to get good, but the commitment is worth it. Period. Cool. Yes. I gave, so the way the review scores broke down, and there's a varied level of this, right? Of Mike, I think he said he had seven hours in. I may be giving him too much, too little there. Uh, he gave it a three out of five so far. Andy's got 20 hours in. He said three out of five so far. I've got 10 hours in, and I said four out of five. Like, this is a Greg ass game because I think the criticisms that are coming up that are totally warranted especially from Andy and Mike were the fact that this doesn't feel like a Sony first party game this doesn't feel like a sucker punches Ghost of Tsushima and where I was like I don't care because I'm having fun doing it moment to moment and sure if you're not in for that ride then I can understand why and like again the open world activities aren't turning anything on their head right it's photo missions it's assassinations it's fugitives it's the missions you run yeah. off and do for me it is the wingsuit to the assassination to the choking people out with my grappling hook and feeling like as i put it in the review that you should watch or listen to on ps i love you xoxo you know i feel like it the combat feels like if batman was league of assassins all the way through he never was like i'm not gonna kill people he's like no no i'm gonna fucking fuck people up like that's how i'm playing it how it feels and i love that so like 
you know, to Phil's article here where he's talking about being 50 hours in, right? Yeah. Uh, GameSpot and like excited to do more. Like, I can't wait to play more of this game. Like, I don't, unless there's some trophy in there that I've missed that's going to be a thing. This is a platinum for sure. Ooh. Especially right now, it's like, there's not like a big. Oh, I'm sorry, what was that? Always good to hear. Oh, yeah. I thought you said first of the year. I was like, no, 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 Tim. Uh, but I, I thought, if, as long as uh, I don't think there's another big review that's going to steal me away and I need to jump into so I can go in and grind on this. What's interesting, I think, uh, again, all of this is, I think, uh, spot on with what we were saying in our review. But one thing I'd want to call out that I love is that, you know, you know, 50 hours in, uh, Phil's talking about, uh, for me, the funny one was that the preview embargo for Rise of the Ronin was like, you have to stop at this mission. That's all you can talk about. And Sony in their documentation was like, hey, this will be like 100, 120 minutes to get to, right? And I got to that mission seven hours in because I'm going, wow, question mark doing by question all. mark, thing by thing, doing everything to open up the map and just be a samurai god. That's awesome. But I'm really enjoying Rise of the Ronin for what it is. I do think it's a video game. Like, you know what I mean? This isn't the get lost in the experience. I'm, in, I'm actually interested to play more, I guess, and commit more to the story eventually because Phil is calling out the politics and the story being there where I'm not seeing that. But again... That's how I'm playing because I'm meeting people for the first time. Like, all right, peace. I got to go pet a cat. I got a cat, man. I got to pet a cat. I got to take a photo over there and I got to climb that building over there. So what about that? (laughs) That's awesome. I'm Uh, happy for you, though. I I always think it's really fun when you find a game that is a little bit like not the thing that everybody's loving the most. But you're like, yo, I'm having so much fun. Yeah. And I want to platinum it. Like that's video games can be so many things. I love that. Like everyone gets that every once in a while and I yeah. whenever you get one it's always like I think extra special just because it you get so into it so I just think it's cool and also you know I think one of the things they call out the souls like and of course Neo and everything that you've seen from Team Ninja Ninja Guide and so on like I'm not that gamer you know like mm-hmm. I don't mind a pair I'm, I'm usually shit at parries so mm-hmm. I don't I usually dodge roll blah, blah, blah. I find the counter spark which is the parry for this game I find it approachable I'm I'm not great at it but I'm good at it and I'm enjoying it and I'm getting better and I feel that cool. fight to fight so I'm excited to see that all expand out as we go uh speaking of expanding out barrett courtney has put in breaking news ladies and gentlemen for now (laughs) we turn our attentions to hell divers 2's twitter account it says breaking in a shocking turn of events sightings of flying bugs have been reported from the front lines according to the ministry of truth no previous sightings have ever been recorded in history of course if you know uh many people like me and of course uh paul tassi at forbes uh, we're basically publicly shamed mm. because we reported on these flying bugs mm. and we're told we were lying that yeah. we were against democracy that we were against freedom and so on one hand I'm happy to see the ministry of truth corroborate our reports on the other hand it sucks to see them say the sightings before weren't real you know mm-hmm. we need justice in this world we, we do truth. to the front lines ladies and gentlemen please hell divers to your pods we need to get back out there and do get it out okay? there, everybody uh, number three on the Roper Report, let's talk about some marathon shakeups yeah. out at Bungie. And these are Bungie shakeups even more than marathon, I guess. Uh, this is a basically required reading. IGN.com, where Rebecca Valentine, I don't know her opinions on Ghostbusters Frozen Empire yet, so I think we can still trust her. Uh, Rebecca Valentine at IGN put up a great piece, and I pulled out several bullet points. But obviously, there's an entire story to go read, okay? And the story came from a couple days ago, too. There's just been a lot of us. A lot of we've been GDC, cover, and so. we've been streaming, we've been doing this. Tim doesn't need to tell you it's old news, but he did. So there you go, ladies and gentlemen. Why are you listening? You know? Thanks, Tim. It's important. We need to talk about this shit. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. (laughs) Amid ongoing anxiety within Bungie following layoffs last year, the studio is now preparing for another shakeup, this time on Marathon. Its upcoming service game intended to be the next step beyond Destiny. According to multiple sources familiar with the matter, Bungie is in the midst of shifting around its creative leadership on Marathon including removing longtime Bungie designer Christopher Barnett, uh, Barrett uh, from the game director role. IGN learned he's being replaced by former Val- Valorant game director Joe Ziegler, uh, who left Riot Games in Bungie, from Bungie, uh, for Bungie. Thank you very much, in 2022. While upcoming Destiny 2 expansion, the final shape is also being prioritized. There are growing fears and rumors that layoffs will immediately follow its release. One person with knowledge of budgets at Bungie told me, quote, nothing adds up. And, quote, something will need to happen to curb costs unless the final shape does so well to cover the gap and people can move to Marathon, end quote. We're jumping around, like I said. Within the company, there is the growing expectation uh, that senior company leadership will leave in droves in the summer of 2026 when the final payouts from Sony's acquisition of the company take effect. 
With this in mind, there is a strong push to get Marathon out the door before then and let whoever takes the reins after that, parentheses, be it Sony or Bungie, worry about how it's sustained. And the final one I wanted to call out. However, sources at the time also told IGN that when leaders are asked if they had considered taking pay cuts uh, prior to making layoff decisions, one responded that Bungie was not, quote, that type of company. Internally, uh, the sentiment is only growing that the final shape needs to succeed for Bungie to avoid further internal turmoil. There is so much here to get into. Great reporting, Rep. Absolutely. Absolutely. It all kind of starts and ends with like, we're in such a bad place as an industry. Mm -hmm. And this is what happens with the acquisitions. And like every decision with these acquisitions matters so much because it has ramifications for years to come. Looking at this from the perspective of, yeah, once the the years come up of people being able to leave because they're the, the guarantee of like, we got acquired, so we're going to stay this many more years then peace we're out we see that everywhere and that yeah. happens that's normally how these things go but for that timeline to time with a big game release and for the expectations to be once that game releases the leadership's going to leave in droves and then people are going to get laid off because they, they don't expect that it's going to hit the goals it needs to well two or things are even worse sorry okay. remember people getting laid off after the final shape then leadership leading in 2026 yeah Okay, sorry. No, it's not it's not gonna it's not gonna be two things at once. There's gonna yeah, be yeah, yeah, yeah. Not that it, I'm just making sure yeah. we're clear on the point. No, no, for sure, for sure, for sure. But I mean, like within a year and a half, right? Yeah, like uh, of each other there. Um, so with all of that, I feel like it's it's so we keep saying this that layoffs are bad everywhere, but it's like even at the top, even at a PlayStation acquired studio, yeah. even when they're putting something out that people are super excited for, and the reading the tea leaves now is saying that like once that thing is released. Then the layoffs, and it's like, why the fuck would the people working there be stoked at all? Yeah, they would be working on this yeah, thing. 100%. Like that is just such a shitty place to be. Of just like, oh man, we're doing this, and it has to exceed expectations just so we get to keep feeling this way for who knows how much longer. Like all of that is so unfortunate. And then there's the other side of this that people aren't going to want to hear. But I see this, and I'm like, all right, Sony acquiring uh, Bungie. And letting them stay as independent as they are, it's like, well, that has totally different um, situations that they then need to deal with. And if they can't hit their own goals, shit's going to fucking happen. And yeah. it's like, if PlayStation had taken them on fully as a PlayStation Studios, that would have meant uh, redundancies in a different way. So I'm not saying that that is the solution, but it's like, there is a lot of issues here. Like, would no love what to know PlayStation's, uh, do they have buyer's remorse on this? Right, you jump in, you do this thing, we're making this live service push. Oh shit, people don't want live services. Okay, wait, this is okay. It's like, I think PlayStation's uh, outlook on live service games is quite different right now than it was a year and a half ago, two years ago. So that you look at this and go, okay, is this what it is? And let alone the fact that, like, what is happening with the Destiny audience right now, right? Mm -hmm. Where it is a game I, I know people still play, obviously, but it's not what it was. It's not like the thing where I, I hear people playing every weekend or jumping in and being excited for it. And then you look at it and they build, they're building to the final shape, which from my understanding is the end of Destiny 2. I think so. Right? Uh, Confine.com slash you're wrong. And so it's like there, there's some inherent excitement there just because of what that means to whoever is excited for that. But then what's next? It's not Destiny 3. It's Marathon. And what's the, the decision making there? Is that like, hey, let's give a, take a break from Destiny because there has been a lot of Destiny and we have seen kind of a trail off, although still a lot of success and a lot of excitement around that game. But with Marathon, like all of this doesn't add up to confidence around that game, right? No. It sounds like the game, like I read this article uh, all the way through too, and like it gets more into even the core of what Marathon is seems to be changing, where they're they're having more like hero type characters. Yeah, it. rather than create your own character, yeah. it'll be like you choose a hero character. Yeah. And it, it really, it reeks of desperation from what we're hearing here. And that is not a good sign for Bungie making a big AAA game that is not a new IP, but it is not an established IP in the way that it actually guarantees sales. You know, it is no. just, it is a known quantity to some. So it's like one of those to pull it back, right? Like desperation, I think might be a bridge too far, but it does smack of oh shit every the industry is changing we need to try to change with it to chase that trend which is guaranteed failure you know what i mean again i know it's we can keep putting on a pedestal as much as we want, but you look at hell divers and why it's a success is era said arrowhead said this is the game we're making right uh rise of the ronin you know you're gonna have a reaction to it love it or hate it 
in, it, but it's one of those things where they said, this is the game we're making, right? Like, it, it, yeah, it's going to be about combat and this and this won't be, it's not going to be for everybody kind of thing, right? It's not a Kurosawa film. It is just go kill some stuff and have fun or whatever. Like that, of course, can hamper your success, but it also means that you're going to find an audience that's like, oh, that's, I like that. Whereas if you're going to go through and I saw people reacting to the removal or the rumor of them changing how your character will be this move to this uh, hero business and be like, oh shit, that was one of my favorite parts of Destiny, right? Of this, that, and the other. So it's like, who will this game serve? What are we going to be looking for out of live service multiplayer games by the time this comes out? And again, to get to the point of like, let's get it out before 2026. So when people, people can just ship it and leave, that doesn't, that doesn't, I don't say, oh, that, that's going to be a roadmap afterwards. That's, that's really, they're going to, they're going to keep to this. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. No, man, it's, it's honestly, it's fucking scary. It's really scary to think about all these decisions being made and seeing the results of them already happening and looking down a couple years at what games can be, like what they might end up looking like. And it's like, fucking man, not good, Greg. Not good indeed. Tim. Really bad. That's why we'll be here to continue to find out what's going on with all this. And Rebecca will keep reporting as it happens. Now, speaking of reporting as it happens, GameSpot, George Yang reports, is... Assassin's Creed Jade delayed. Uh, one of Ubisoft's next entries in Assassin's Creed franchise is reportedly delayed. This time, it's the mobile game set in China called Assassin's Creed Jade. Uh, according to Reuters, uh, the game was supposed to be released for iOS and Android sometime this year, but has since been delayed to 2025. It's being co-developed by Level Infinite, and the delay is reportedly due to parent company Tencent shifting its mobile strategy. Hmm. The company now wants to focus on more smaller, easy-to-play games rather than large franchise ones uh, from foreign companies. <laughs> well, oh shit then. Because let me tell you, Tencent, that ain't the place to be with Assassin's Creed. <sighs> Again, we talk about shifting, changing trends, how long it takes to make a game. This game that Barrett has pulled up the trailer for that you've seen, right, that we know about, that is the, like, to be this close, and now you're like, okay, well, this isn't the strategy anymore. Like, this isn't what it's going to be. And I wonder, too, as you look at, like, you know, Ubisoft always trying to, and I don't mean this as, a, as offensively as it sounds, milk Assassin's Creed. Like, you know, we saw Assassin's Creed VR come out this year and not even fucking move the needle, right? Yeah. And that's p partly VR, that's partly whatever. But like, you look at this and it's like, yeah, are people stoked about this one? Is that where they're going to want to go to? And, you know, I, we, I've talked about this a lot, but this is kind of the, the moment where mobile games and not console games and pc games like we're getting closer and closer to what is the difference actually in terms of how they're made and what they can look like and play like yeah and i think that we're not quite there yet which means that you see something like this and it's just really not that exciting like i feel like it's it you still look at it and you're like oh wow this looks looks like an assassin's creed game but then it's like the more you start hearing about it you're like oh man and now they're talking about uh, shipped in mobile strategy, easy to play games, all that. It's like, oh, they, I'm not feeling good about this. <laughs> and I wasn't feeling good before, but now it's like... Now I'm really not feeling like, good. And again, this isn't just like, oh, they're talking shit. This is looking at Ubisoft and the decisions they've made the last decade. And it's like, I don't know why we would have much faith. No. I, again, I think, you know, we, we are in such an interesting point as an industry. When you talk about trend chasing, when you talk about committing to something, right? And... Ubisoft committed when they were trying, and I'm going back when we're at IGN, committed when they were trying to be bought up by Vivendi mm -hmm. to doubling down on these open world big games. This is where we're going to make, and it worked really well, and people were into that for a long time, and then suddenly, not that suddenly, but they weren't, yeah. and then Ubisoft is kind of out in the fucking weeds of like, oh shit, well, we made all these games, and people aren't stoked for them anymore, start canceling things, doing things, changing things, and it was the, we are now going to double down on our IP, and remember, of course, Assassin's Creed used to be an annual franchise. They said very bluntly, when will it stop being annual? When you stop buying it, people stop buying it. They stop doing that. But now to sit here and be like, cool, well, you got Jade coming to mobile and you got Infinity that's going to be this whole thing. And then you got uh, Red and then you got Hex. And then you got, and it's like, okay, that's too much Assassin's Creed already. Like we're, uh, the, the audience isn't what it was in 2011, 12, whatever, when Assassin's Creed was a fucking huge deal every time. And on top of that, you have Assassin's Creed's coming out, like Origins and Odyssey and Valhalla, that come out, and they don't just come out. They come out, and then there's a follow-up, and then there's the DLC, and then there's the season, and then there's the collaboration yeah. deal. Yeah. It's like Assassin's Creed's just always happening, right? Yeah. And it's like, there's a lot of people that, that do enjoy it. And like the to go back to what you're saying about, we'll stop making it when they stop buying it. People clearly then are buying these things and playing these things, and Assassin's Creed is a mega hit, and they're making all these properties for a reason. But we're just back where we were in a new different way 
um, and with a Ubisoft that a lot of people are just kind of fed up with. Yeah, exactly. Now, we want to see the change, obviously. And but again, way, a ship that big that is Ubisoft. Yeah. Uh, that many studios, that many employees, it takes so long to turn that wheel when you have so many things gestating. Yeah. You're, you know, Ship jumping wheel. off of... You know what I mean? Yeah, uh, Skull and Bones, yeah. yeah. Uh, jumping off of what we're talking about with Marathon, right? Where it's like, oh shit, they're trying to change this thing and it, how close is that supposed to be to coming out? But they're like, well, we need to shift because of X, Y, and Z and what you're seeing out there. And like, again, like, I feel like that is the problem with so many big games is that when you get to be that giant AAA game, I think it's very hard to be like, this is the vision of the game. And when you talk about then stock prices and you talk about shareholders and you talk about your boss's 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 boss to the CEO, to the, you know what I mean? Like, There's so many cooks in the kitchen that I think that's why you can see an Arrowhead make something like Helldivers. You can make a Larian see something like Baldur's Gate 3, right? Where it's like, no, we are committed to this vision and this is what it's going to be. And I, even though it's similar more similar to ubisoft but i'll toss it in there like something like uh, uh nintendo be like no this is what zelda is now this is go we're gonna take a risk on breath of the wild oh it's huge this is the next risk and be different and you know the stick everything together of tears of the kingdom like these are gambles but i think a gamble based on the bedrock of like this is our vision for this game that will speak to somebody right like that's why indie studios can have breakout success and have these uh audiences that are so dialed in on discord and yada 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 and again have different way different levels of success yeah. but again that comes back to the bedrock of this is the game we are making this is a game that you can look at and say oh that's a tim game that's a greg game that's a whatever game yep and like i think you know you look at like i saw it go through a long time ago i apologize chat's moving it went through of like oh you know ronin being an assassin's creed clone right and it's like well yeah that's why i'm stoked about ronin like i do like the open world assassin's creed run around and do everything i don't know, you know, depending on the Assassin's and again, there's multiple types of Assassin's Creed's now, but like, I appreciate that Ronan's story is pretty stripped back. It's not me having to talk to everybody and do the whole thing and blah, 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 blah. Like, there's the bonds, sure, but they're very light in terms of like what you're doing to get to the next thing, to get the next skill point, to do the whatever. Like, it's, it's, I, I, I think it was, yeah, Steven Totillo at the preview of Ronan put out an Axios newsletter uh, that was like, this is a game that respects your time. And it's the idea that the horse can auto run. The when the horse runs up, you get on the horse. You can set your settings to auto sell stuff, auto dis, uh, break down stuff. Go in and be like, only break down stuff that's below you know this rarity or whatever. Like, there's a whole bunch of like actual things in there that are like, oh, let's and fast travel is plentiful. Like, you can yeah. just beam all over the map to do the thing to do the mission, right? Like, it's a game that is like learning from all those things while also being that thing. If that makes sense. Totally. I digress. I want you to know, Tim. I've logged back into Slack. Fantastic. I think I, you know, if you don't know, ladies and gentlemen, Slack threatened everybody. It was like, if you don't turn on two factor authentication, we'll kick you out. And I said, I'm like, so you try. And then they kicked me out. Mm -hmm. But now I'm back in. It looks like it's back, baby. I'm back at, no, hold on. Yeah, no, it's doing this thing over there. So I can still see when Barrett sends me little funny cat memes. And I like that. You Anyways, know. ladies yeah, and gentlemen, that's me all the time sending you cat memes. I call I you believe the cat it man. When he said it. You what? know? I call you the cat man. Oh, yeah? yeah. He's the cat man. That was, a, that was a nickname my buddy and I gave each other in high school. We were cat man and bada B. And we were like 40s gangsters. Ba we would, bada B? Oh, like bada, bada B? B. Like yeah. bada Bing? Bada yeah. B? Yeah. You were bada War. B, of course, right? No, I think I was cat man. You were cat man. Yeah. My, uh, my buddy Rick, me, uh, Ricky was bada B. Ricky. I was thinking about a nickname for you yesterday. This is a true story, Barrett. As I was getting in my car, true and I was story. like, "What if I called you my little burrito?" No, no, absolutely not. What if I called you my little burrito? No, even more so. Absolutely what if I called not. you cat name? <laughs> <laughs> Tim, I'm sick of all these Barrett <laughs> nicknames and big news. I want smaller news. Where should I go? You go to our last story, the Wee News Channel, where we cover all the small news items that you need to know about. <laughs> You gotta wait. You know what I mean? Oh, you gotta get you the gotta drop get in there. Intro, you got man. the Wii Didn't News they? in there, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, number one on the Wii News, of course, there is a Prince of Persia roadmap you put in here. What's so, going yeah, on? Here's the thing. The roadmap came out last week uh, where they dropped the, the different waves of DLC, but yesterday, uh, right as we were ending Games Daily, they, yeah. they put out a, hey, update one is out now. Um, and the most exciting thing about it, Greg, is the Sands of Time outfit is finally Ooh, game. Really excited about that for myself. 
Um, they added speedrun uh, speed mode, permadeath mode, four new outfits, and uh, pretty much for anybody that beat the game but hasn't 100 percented it yet but now wants to, um, they added these new treasure maps that kind of just like show you where all the collectibles are on the map and make it a lot easier so Got you don't it. need to be like, Love where it. are these things? Um, which would have been very helpful. I'm surprised it didn't uh, launch ago. with the Sands of Time outfit. I think they wanted to hold off. You know what I mean? They want to get like, you back, baby. Assassin's Creed Mirage like launched with a Sands of Time outfit. Yeah, they they did. Uh, it launched with the well with DLC or with um pre-order bonus stuff. You got the Warrior Within one. Mm. So I think they were trying to like make this like a Moment. it's back, you know. Yeah. And oh, I'm stoked about it. It's fantastic. Uh, also in your Wii news, uh, Horizon Forbidden West Complete Edition is out on PC today. Activision's Call of Duty Warzone cool. Mobile launches today. I think that's awesome. You know, a big-ass P uh, PS5 game coming to PC. And this is I, another example of, like, this Forbidden West hasn't been out that long. Yeah. You know? So it's, like, really... over two years. I want to respect the strategy PlayStation has of getting things in more places. Like, I feel like it's, it's only good for the games and for the industry. Yep, for gamers. Just like getting Call of Duty Warzone Mobile today. That's out there. And Verdance is in it. I know people are stoked about that. Uh, Atlas has announced that it's moving up the release date for Shimigami Tensei 5 Vengeance by one week from June 21st to June 14th. And then Suicide Squad tweeted ahead of season one going live on March 28th with the Joker. I added that part. There will be a new patch on March 26th containing many bug fixes and gameplay improvements. Cool. I am fascinated. Yeah, I want to see what those numbers look like next week for people coming back to Suicide Squad. Will this move the needle? Will Joker? Will the content actually be dope? You know what I mean? Will people come back for it? At least four. At least four. Paul Tassiano is one of them because he gives me my, my updates on Twitter. He'll be back for that. Uh, also, I I don't know anything about this. You can you toss a link in if you want. I know PSN is down. I saw chat talking about it, and then I do have Neat Gobbler <laughs> in your wrong saying PSN has been down for a while. Oh, man. So Pokemon well, Go was down this morning. Oh, my God. What did you do? I fucking panicked. Yeah? Yeah. There was a moment uh, over the... Something's going on with Pokemon Go, and I don't like it. Because over the weekend, I got logged out of my account, and it wouldn't let me log back in. And it was like, this account cannot be authenticated. And I was like, oh, oh no. Yeah. I, I don't know if I could be okay after that, Greg. Hmm. Like, if it just... If my it was account done. was just You started gone, fresh? I... Wouldn't I might, that be kind of nice? You could do it all over again. No. Catch them all and no, get you and Goldfarb back no. out there. Uh-uh. We asked people watching live, of course, to go to kindoffunny.com slash you're wrong and tell us what we screw up as we screw it up. And I'm sorting through a whole bunch of people trying to be comedians out here. You know uh -huh. what I mean? Um. Okay. So Arsonist216 says, the final shape is the final DLC for Destiny 2, but there will be three episodes after that that will be released in the year following to finish all storylines. So they the final shape isn't the final DLC. Exactly. They will replace the previous uh, seasonal storytelling structure with standalone pieces of content to close out the light versus dark saga. Well, so, I mean, I think he's only you're wrong in there because then it will kind of lead into 2026. Also, I guess what, everybody in the current industry landscape, don't hold your fucking breath for that other stuff, all right? You don't think so? I mean, if you got to go all hands on deck for Marathon, what are, and what are these little things? I don't know. You know what I mean? But like, oh, they got to finish the light and dark saga and yada, yada, yada. We'll see. We'll, we'll figure it out. I wish you I wish you the best. It's I all people. Like they're going to end Destiny 2. I'm just telling you what I'm seeing. All right, what, I'm, what I'm thinking. You know what I mean? Mm. You think they're going to end Suicide Squad? I mean, isn't it done? No. The end game for Suicide Squad is like, yo. You got a lot more shit to fight, and we're going to put it out slowly. Here's Joker. No, they're not going to end that. No, they're not going to end that shit. So anything can happen. Don't worry about it, ladies and gentlemen. All right? Uh, I remember, of course, you can be part of the show by super chatting. Aaron made you laugh, gave us two bucks just to say, kind of funny games daily is never live. It's off by a few milliseconds. That is true. However you value true. your $2, I hope you enjoy spending L it. Liar502 right? says, did they even start Suicide Squad? <laughs> <laughs> got him! Ladies and gentlemen, this has been another episode of Kinda Bunny Games Daily. If you loved it, spread the love to us with $10. You can get the Kinda Funny membership over on Patreon, over on YouTube. And of course, you get each and every episode of Games Daily ad-free. You'd get every other show we do ad-free. You'd get the ability to watch the other podcasts live as we record them. And of course, you'd get the daily multimedia experience, Greg Way each and every day, which I already kind of said. Uh, of course, maybe you don't want any of that stuff, but you still love us. Just give us the 10 bucks for a month. What are you fucking, what, what's the big deal? You know what I mean? You could also get merch on there. You could join the kind of funny happy hour. There's always something fun happening on Patreon and or YouTube with your kind of funny bucks. What? Nothing.
What horrible thing did somebody say? No, it's not horrible. Just like sometimes if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything at all. So I'm gonna not say anything. Okay, fine. Yeah. All right, fine. You tell me later, though? I'll tell you later. Okay, great. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you're watching live, we're about to go do the f- review for X-Men 97, episodes 1 and 2. Oh, my God. Uh, so get ready for that. You can watch it later, of course, on the Screencast podcast feed. You could go there right now to get WrestleMania ranked. You can go get PS I Love You XO for the Rise of the Runner review. You, of course, could watch more streams that the boys will be doing. There's always something happening kind of There's funny. so much happening. And we couldn't do it without you. Thank you for your support. And no, until next time, it's been our pleasure to serve you.